Good morning. Merry Christmas. Oh my gosh. That was a bunch of Scrooges in here. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to those watching on our I campus today too also. Uh, open your Bibles with me, you would, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. That's uh, one of the uh, places people read, go to read the Christmas story. Um, we're, we're still in our series entitled Real World Faith. And the, the, the comparison is what I call plastic faith versus real world faith. So there's people who have what I call plastic faith. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It means that their faith only really works on good days, that, that when there's struggle and there's doubt and there's storms, there's something missing, that there's something that's empty, there's something that's not the way it should be. That's kind of what plastic faith is. And a lot of times it's about rituals, not relationship. It's about running through the routines of church or the routines of you know, whatever they've been raised in and as opposed to really having a life-changing relationship with Christ. And so that's really the deal. This morning, the message is actually entitled that real-world faith is messy. And what I mean by that, and I'm going to use the story of Jesus, but what I mean by that is, is that real-world faith, um, the plastic faith is not usually messy. Real-world faith is usually messy. Okay, so plastic faith is that things are pretty simple. You know, we keep them in our little boxes, and those are things going okay, then I'm okay. That's plastic faith. And, we, and plastic faith wants to avoid the mess. We want to avoid anything that creates fear, anything that makes us stretched or, you know, makes us feel uncomfortable. We want to just stay in our little box and, and be comfortable. That's, you know, but real world faith, you can't separate the stretching of God from faith, that God is always going to stretch us. Matter of fact, it requires no faith to believe something that doesn't stretch you, that doesn't challenge you in some way, right? It just, it, it requires no faith. There's just no faith at all. So like, for instance, you sit in a chair and we can say, well, the chair required faith. You've been sitting in those chairs a long time. You sat in those chairs for, in some of your cases, you've sat in those chairs for years. It, you didn't have faith to sit that. You assumed the chair was going to hold you. But if you went to the chair and you looked down, there's no legs, just a chair bottom in the back sitting there in midair. And you're like, is that going to hold me? It requires faith to sit in a chair that you don't think will hold you. It doesn't require faith to sit in the same chair you've sat in a thousand times. It's always held you. So there's plastic faith that really doesn't require much faith at all. But if you're going to engage God, if you're going to have a relationship with the living God, he's going to stretch you. He's going to work in you to transform you and change you from the inside out. That, re, that get, it's going to get messy. You'll, you'll have thoughts, you'll have doubts, you'll have fears, you'll feel uncomfortable, you'll feel, whatever the word is, it's just, that's the way God works. You know, if God wants you to cry, I mean, you're like, well, I don't want to cry, I'm not going to cry. Okay, don't cry. But if God's really doing transformational work in you, there are times that you just have emotion. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a part of the healing process sometimes. Well, I'm never going to, and whatever the thing you'll never do, if God wants you to do that, then it may be hard to do that, okay? Or let's say you're trying to get over some kind of hurt in your life, or you're trying to, you know, an area of forgiveness, or maybe it's a relationship that God wants to do something in, or just name the topic, right? If God's working in you, it's going to be messy because we're not perfect people. And we feel uncomfortable, and sometimes we fail, and um, it's just part of the deal. So what I want to do is I want to begin with reading to you the typical Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, I'll read the first 20 verses. Verse 1, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Verse 4, now Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who had been pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in the manger. 
Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, or in highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom, who, whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, they had gone to heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord had told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told them about this child. All who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God to all things, or for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Isn't that just a precious story? I mean, it's so cute and sweet, and it's plastic. It's real. It actually happened. Exactly like that. But boy, did they leave out a lot of details. That is plastic. I mean, what, what that story is, is, let's just say that I left here today, and I traveled to uh, California. And along my way, um, I was attacked by, a, you know, a bandits, and... Um, and so I got robbed and mugged and beat up and spent a couple days in the hospital recovering from that. And then I, my car broke down. I got back on the road. My car broke down in the middle of nowhere at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then a mass murderer came and tried to get me. And I got rid of him. I killed him. And then I kept going. And the bear attacked me. And I beat the bear up. And then finally, you know, a month later, I make it to California. And then... I tell the story to you this way. Yep, uh, yeah, we, we left. Uh, we left to head toward California, got down there, and uh, it, it was a really good time. Well, it, that's what happened, but boy, I sure left a lot of details out. You know what I'm saying? Okay, let's kind of think about this story. So here's the point. Number one in the outline, let me kind of give you the points. I'm going to go through these pretty quick today because of just the, we had a lot of baptism in first service. We, got some, we, won't have, we have one baptism in second service, but we have some videos to show you some other baptisms that happened. Um, anyway. So, number one in the outline is the typical Christmas story um, uh, misses the point. It misses the point. It, it disguises the baby, you know, it, it, what, no, it disguises the king of kings as a baby. He comes as a baby. It's so innocent and so helpless, and everybody has to take care of the baby, and the baby's harmless. The, baby, the baby's just so sweet. He's just the baby in the manger and all that kind of stuff, and we're used to hearing the baby in the manger story, right? And that was just so precious and all that kind of thing around. It was just great. It's wonderful, and, you know, the angels and the shepherds, and, the, you know, it's just a great story. But that baby, he grew up to become the king of kings, the, the lord of lords. Okay, the baby that's so cute and cuddly, he grew up to be the dude who said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross every day, and then come follow me. He, he grew up to be the, the, the adult who said, um, if you're ashamed of me here, I'll be ashamed of you when we get to heaven where my father is. So don't get confused about the baby. The baby doesn't save you. What happens many times is, is there's this false sense of security that comes because we worship the baby. You know, we believe in Jesus got born and Christmas, you know, and that kind of stuff. And we may come to church on Christmas or we may, you know, have special decorations at our house and put out the nativity scene or whatever. And there's almost this false sense of security that, that the baby is cool. And the baby's cool. But the baby doesn't save you. He just doesn't. Number two in the outline, that everything about the birth of Jesus was messy. There is not a single detail about the birth of Jesus that wasn't messy. Not a single one. I mean, let's just begin with, they lived in a place, Nazareth, and she's pregnant. Okay, well, let's just pause and back up a little bit farther than that. A homegirl was a teenager who wasn't married, who claimed to be a virgin, and, she's, and now she's saying she's pregnant. Okay, an angel comes to Mary and says, here's what's going to take place, and you're going to be the mother of the Son of the living God. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer of all mankind. Now, just pause for a second. They, they, had, they were expecting a Messiah at some point in time, but if the 15 or 16 or 18 or wherever she was girl comes and says, oh, by the way, I'm getting ready to be the mother of the Messiah, Everybody thinks she's crazy. You don't miss the part. I mean, you see, it immediately becomes messy. 
Well, how do you know, Mary? An angel came and talked to me. You've been drinking too much, honey. Maybe you have some things called mental illness. I mean, that just can't be true. Did anyone else see the angel? No. And you think that you're going to be the mother of the Messiah, the God, the, the, the Savior of the world, and little old normal Mary, because, I mean, wouldn't God pick someone else? I mean, someone way, you know, fancier or more money, somebody who lived in a palace. I mean, why would God pick you? Well, then, okay, she's, she's, she wasn't married to Joseph. They, they were what we, what we would call engaged, but their, their culture was a little different how they did that. So they were engaged, okay? So she's engaged to Joseph. Joseph would have been much older, most likely, than she was. But anyway, she's engaged to Joseph, and she's got to tell her fiancé, this is what just took place. Now, when you tell him that, like right after, let's just say day one it happens, Right? And the, the, the angel told me this, and let's just say he told her, she told him right after that. He's not believing her. He's looking at this girl that he wants to marry, and he's thinking, okay, you're, she's nuts. There is no way that, that she's nuts. Okay, that's just not, that she's nuts. All right, then time passes. She's showing. Right? Her belly is getting bigger. There is visual evidence that something has occurred and there is a baby that is on the way. And what does Mary say? It's God's. What? Nobody believed her. Well, I'm still a virgin. Okay, everybody in the known world knows that's not how that works. You can't be a virgin and get pregnant. It ain't working for you. No, really. They didn't believe her. They were talking about. It. I mean, just, this is the this is the way Jesus was born. He was born in an environment. I mean, Joseph. He wanted to quietly put her away. See, quietly divorce her. It would be. He wanted to do it quietly. That he's a good man. He didn't want to embarrass her any more than she's embarrassing herself because she's obviously Looney Tunes. But God spoke to him. And his faith is getting messy because instead of getting rid of her and her craziness, he thinks he's supposed to hang on for a while. So he maintained his relationship with her. And now she's showing. Don't you think he ever sat there and wondered to himself, what in the world am I doing? She keeps telling me she's not, you know, she's a virgin, but she's obviously pregnant. She keeps telling me it's God's. Don't you think he ever wondered when that baby was born who it was going to look like? Don't take the mess out of the story. Then, in the midst of all that, dude says, Caesar says, hey, we need to have a census. You need to see how many people there are. And so they've got to travel from where they were in Nazareth to Bethlehem. And so whether she was on a donkey or she was on a camel or she was in a cart being pulled by a donkey or camel doesn't really matter. The point is, it was not comfortable. She was pregnant. Don't make that story sound like it was fun. Okay, women, you need to put your fingers really deep into your ears so you don't hear me. Men, just picture for a second. Pregnant, about to have a baby, going over rough terrains, rocks, things like that. How many times do you think that she, he heard the how far we have to go, are we there yet, can we stop and pee? <laughs> right? If you haven't had a, a wife pregnant yet, you'll understand that later. How uncomfortable must she have been? How hot, you do know they didn't have air conditioners, right? How hot must it have been? It was not a comfortable environment. It was not fun. It was frustrating. It was messy. Then they get there. We arrive. We're looking for a place to stay. There's no place to stay because everybody's coming to Bethlehem that was part of a family tree from Bethlehem. So everybody's coming. It's like a big family reunion, like right? it's homecoming, right? Everybody's coming home. Everybody's saying there's no place. There's no extra spaces. There's no room in the inn. There's no guest room at the house. Like, well, why didn't you call ahead, you know? <laughs> Do you think there was no conversation about that? 
Okay, now remember, Mary's pregnant. You do know that when the girls are pregnant, there are hormones that have a tendency to rise and fall. Everybody understands that, right? Mary's a person. Don't think her hormones wasn't doing hormonal things. I would not have wanted been Joseph go back and say, yeah, uh, there's not a place for us, but they said we could have the baby in the stall. There's not a mother in the world who wants to hear that story, right? So then they're in the stall. They're in, you know, the whole baby. The we make the baby in the manger sound so clean, right? If, if you've never been around animals and stalls, then you, maybe that's okay for you. But I'm just telling you, animals in stalls and places where animals are living is muddy and in the mud is mixed manure and pee and stuff and it's not a clean place, okay? It's messy. But they're there. That's where they're going to be at. I'm sure there was a little tension about that. Then you go through the whole childbirth thing, right? And you got people, strangers coming and talking to you. And picture the, the, the shepherd. They're out there minding their own business. It's, they're terrified by the, and the angels showing up in the middle of the night. Okay? These guys don't get terrified by nothing. They're used to fighting off animals from their flocks. They're terrified. They're going to even leave their flocks and go make this trip to find out if this is true or not, right? This is, it wasn't the, the smoothest transition. They get there, okay. Well, the baby's born, and they stay around Bethlehem for a while, and that's where the whole, you know, the, the wise men probably showed up, you know, a couple years later. But anyway, a while later, the wise men, they weren't, wise men fit in the nativity scenes, but they were not at the birth of Jesus. They were like, so like put your wise men out like in a year and a half from now, and that'd be accurate, okay, but anyway, so, Wise men come. Herod finds out about it. He's the king. Herod is upset. Herod's not happy. Herod decides that he is going to have to kill all the babies that are two years old and down. Because he's been told that the Messiah was born. And he's believed that the Messiah was born. That the king of kings. And so he is a king, and if that's the king of kings, I don't want that guy to take my throne. So he doesn't just kill all the babies in Bethlehem, but Bethlehem and the surrounding area. Okay, so Joseph gets a dream, and Joseph takes his baby and his mama, or baby mama, and they head to Egypt. They become refugees. They leave Bethlehem. They go to a different country called Egypt to hide because Herod is killing babies. Okay, pause that for a second. Now think what that means for the people who live in Bethlehem. So if you were in Bethlehem, in the area of Bethlehem, at the time that Jesus was born, it sounds like a great time. Star in the sky, and it's awesome, it's great, and all the, hey, that Jesus was born, okay, it's all great. Okay. Then Herod is sending guards, Roman, you know, sending soldiers to come to your house and to take your two-year-old and down male children away from you and kills them. Now, we don't know how many that was. Was that 20 or 2,000? Nobody knows how many children we're talking about. But if you were a male and you were born in the time frame that Herod thought Jesus was born in. And two years later, when he figures out, because that's when the wise men, the magi come, when he figures out that the reason they had come was for to see the Messiah, when he figured out that that's what the story was, he had decided that he wanted to kill Jesus. So God tells Joseph, Joseph sneaks his family out and they're in Egypt now. Herod realizes that Joseph has skipped the country. He can't find Joseph. So what's he going to do? Instead of saying, oh, I missed it. He says, they're hiding around here somewhere. Because he didn't realize he'd left the country. Let's go, we're going to kill all the babies. Any baby born in the last two years that's male is going to die. Now think how messy that was. How many moms and dads gave up a two-year-old or less son because Herod was paranoid about the Messiah having been born? How much pain and anguish was there surrounding the birth? We always talk about the birth. It brought great joy to all. It brought great joys in the Savior of the world. It brought a lot of pain to a lot of moms and dads who lived in Bethlehem at the same time frame. 
Are you tracking? Yes? Every single thing around the birth of Jesus was messy. You can't find something about the birth of Jesus that wasn't messy. If you say, oh no, read that story again. It's so pretty and precious. It's plastic. The real story has a lot more details in it. And all those details are messy. They're all about a God who so loved the world that he sent his son to be born, to live. But all around that, was mess, including babies dying. Number three in the outline, everything around the life of Jesus was messy. You can't find me anything about the life of Jesus that wasn't messy. Again, he's born of a virgin. Ain't nobody believing that. Nobody is buying that. So now we have a baby. We just don't know if it was Joseph's or not. Who's, I mean, it's somebody's. And don't you know there was gossip? Don't you know there was talking around the town coffee shop about, you know, in beauty shops the other day about who's that baby must belong to? Because it looks like so-and-so or whatever they would have said. Right? They weren't buying that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah. Do you ever think that Mary, you know, he's 15 years old. He didn't start his ministry, he's 30. Do you ever think Mary said, I'm looking at 15 thinking, is he really the son of God? Do you think Joseph's ever had the whispering thought that kind of float through and like, I mean, was, has Mary been completely honest with me? I mean, don't make them plastic, is my point. Don't, don't make them like there was, they were not human. They're humans, they have thoughts. They had emotions, they had fears, they had concerns, they had worries. Now, God may have given them peace, I'm sure he did. God may have surrounded them with faith and hope and that kind of supernatural stuff, right? But don't think they didn't have the moments where they had thoughts. They did. And Jesus is trying to figure out why he's so different. You know, at 12 years old, he's teaching the Pharisees, the teachers of the law in the temple. And he's amazing everybody how. And even then, he, his parents, he disobeyed his parents to do it. He's 30. He's ready to start his ministry. He was ready to start his ministry, and, and from the moment he began his ministry, there were people who celebrated him and people who wanted to kill him. Look at that miracle he did. Yeah, but he violated the law because he did that miracle on the Sabbath. There are people who, he's, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ. Look at the miracle he did. And there are people saying, no, he's not the Messiah. He's, he's a demon. He's empowered by Satan himself. He goes to his own hometown. He's been doing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, every town he went to, people being healed and, you know, the blind are seeing and the lame are walking and all these things are taking place and, and he's this amazing teacher and all this stuff is great. He goes back to his own hometown, right? The place that they knew the mother who said she was a virgin when she conceived him. They go back to their own hometown, and uh, he, uh, the Bible says, and I told him this a few months ago, the, the, it, the thing everybody remembers is the Bible says that he couldn't do miracles in his own hometown because of lack of faith. But if we back up a few verses, it says, so I'm going, you know, here's what it says. It says, they were amazed at his teaching and at the miracles he would do. So these are in his own hometown. They were amazed. They were astonished, I think it says, at all the things that he could accomplish. And then, right below that, either one or two verses, there was a sentence. Somebody asked the question, isn't that Joseph's son? That's all he said. In the verse or two right below that, they were offended at him. And then Jesus couldn't do miracles. So just think that through for a second. He's Jesus. He has left, left the homestead, right? He's going out. He's doing miracles everywhere. Everybody out here follows him. They believe in him. They, they would like to see the miracles he's going to do. He comes back home. He's ready to say, okay, let me prove to you that I am the son of God, that I am the Christ, that I am the one born of a virgin. Because and technically speaking, if they would have accepted that on that day, it had been great. After 30 years of being seen as a liar. I mean, his mom, his mom, okay, people had gotten over it. 
But 30 years later, they still knew she was the woman who claimed that was the son of God, that was the Messiah, born of a virgin. And they're thinking, she's a liar. There's no way that's possible. Here Jesus is getting ready to answer the whole thing. Let me show you some miracles. They are amazed. They were astonished until someone just said, hey, isn't that Mary and Joseph's son? And the moment they said, isn't that Mary and Joseph's son? That fast. They changed. No, he's not the Messiah. He's not the Christ. He's the boy whose mama has been lying all these years. And Jesus, they went from being amazed and astonished to they went to being offended and angry and he couldn't do miracles in his own hometown. His great crowds that followed him, you know, they loved it when he's breaking bread and feeding and feeding the thousands with, you know, broken bread and fishes and all that kind of stuff. That was awesome. Big, woo big crowds. And they loved when he's healing people and all that kind of stuff. And they loved this cool teaching. That was awesome. Until he started talking about the cost of following him. And the crowd started dwindling down. And in the three-year window, I mean, he only had a ministry of three years. In the three-year window, he went from obscurity and not being known to being a rock star, to being having masses of people who followed him to having those masses of people be the very same people who screamed crucify him, crucify him, who chose to take a a known lifelong criminal and murderer to be released over him. I mean, just imagine everything about the life of Jesus was messy. His disciples who lived with him, one of those are the ones who betrayed him, who turned on him. That was Judas, right? Not a single one of his followers was at the tomb on the third day waiting for him to resurrect. Nobody believed him. He spent all that time, he did all those miracles. He told them over and over again, here's what's gonna take place in me. Here's who I am. Here's what God is going to do over and over and over again. They watched him be crucified. They watched him die. And instead of them seeing that as one more step in God's plan of redemption or that that was the process that which resurrection was going to occur on the third day, they weren't waiting for him in the tomb. They didn't believe him. The women who went and found that the tomb was empty, they weren't going to see if the tomb was empty. They were going to take more spices to put on his his dead body, his decaying body. They they wanted to make him smell better. They, They weren't going with expectation. When the women came back and said to the men, hey, he's resurrected. The tomb is empty. The men didn't believe them because women weren't good witnesses. You can't believe a woman in that culture. The men just didn't, they didn't believe. So the men had to run to see if it was really true or the women were crazy. (laughs) He's looked exactly the same. He's resurrected. They see him on the road and even a disciple like Thomas even though he sees him. He's like, can, can, can I just see those hands for a second? I need to see some scars. Everything about the birth was, of Jesus was messy and everything about his entire life was messy. Number four in the outline. Christmas means nothing without the transforming power of Christ in your mess. Christmas means nothing without the transforming power of Christ in your mess. I mean, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, in case you were confused by that. That's just the day we choose to celebrate his birth. But you can celebrate his birth all you want to. It means nothing without the power of Christ in you. Now, the power of Christ in you is the Holy Spirit. Everything God ever did in Scripture, he did through the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, except for the things that he did as in like Jesus had to die on a cross himself, okay? In the Bible, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Spirit. 
We say God did. God did all these things. God resurrected Christ the dead. God impregnated Mary. God, that's, how, that's the term we use. But there's the term God, it includes all three of them. And then there's the specific God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit part of it. When God the Father said in Genesis, let there be light, if you read Genesis chapter one and following, it's the Holy Spirit who made that happen. Okay? When God the Father says, to, you know, he has a sense of an angel say, hey, give Mary a heads up that she's getting ready to be the mother of the Son of God. And she's going to call him and that kind of stuff, right? He sent an angel to give Mary a heads up, but it was the Holy Spirit he sent to actually impregnate Mary, right? When Jesus, right where he began his ministry, it wasn't Jesus the man. Jesus laid down his deity, his 100% Godheadness. He was God, but he laid that down, took on 100% being man and became a man so he could be our author and finisher of our faith. He could be our example to follow, right? He, he didn't cheat. Jesus did not cheat. Jesus wasn't like, well, I'm 50% man, 50% God. He's 100% man. He laid down his deity, his Godheadness, so he become the author and the finisher of our faith, the person we could emulate, the person we could imitate, right? That's what Jesus did. He is 100% God. He is going through life. When he got ready to begin his ministry, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, it says, as a dove. Now, the reason that happened was for the people who were watching his baptism, so they saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. It's like a visual form. It was like to say, I'm different. I'm changed now. They didn't. They just, they saw something happen. So they, they had a visual um, reference point for what just took place. So they never had that happen before, right? Jesus was different. Not because, the, by, baptism doesn't save you. Don't misunderstand that part. That was the moment he began his ministry. His baptism was that moment and the Holy Spirit came upon him. The moment of salvation is the moment the Holy Spirit indwells you. Okay? So in the phrase, when it says that, nothing without the transforming power of Christ. The transforming power of Christ is the Holy Spirit. The one who transformed Christ was the Holy Spirit. Now he was Jesus, son of God, but he laid that down according to be man so he could be one of us, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one we're supposed to emulate. So God sent the Holy Spirit upon him. He empowered Jesus and then Jesus began his ministry. Those miracles, that was the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. It wasn't just Jesus doing miracles. It was the Holy Spirit doing miracles. God wanted to do miracles through Jesus, so God said to the Holy Spirit, heal those people. The Holy Spirit through Jesus did that. That's the process. I mean, so I can just go down that whole list, right? The miracles that were all the people following him, that was the Holy Spirit. Jesus being able to speak in such a way that the masses were drawn, and that was the Holy Spirit. Jesus having the strength and the power, those kind of things, to walk through all the temptations, to be the savior of the world, the one unblemished lamb that could take all the sin of all mankind and die and be our savior. And that was the power of the Holy Spirit in him. Jesus being able to walk through the process of crucifixion. That was the power of the Holy Spirit in him. That the very same power who raised Christ from the dead he lives in you if you know Christ, your Savior. Now, here's what happens. Some of us don't know Christ, our Savior. We know church. We know religion. We know the baby that was born in a manger, and we love him, and we worship him. But we don't know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have a religion. We have some rituals. We have some things we do, but we don't know Jesus. Christmas means absolutely nothing without the transforming work of the Christ in you. That's the person of the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ, your Savior, the moment you say, I believe on Jesus as my Savior, because technically it's not about your doing, not about baptism, not about giving, not about volunteering. It's about believing on Christ. That's when salvation occurs. But the Bible also says that demons believe, and they're not saved, obviously. So it's, it's believing, but what, really when it takes place is when the Holy Spirit indwells you, when he lives inside of you. So how you hear me talk about it here a lot is, is that how I know that I'm saved, how you should know that you're saved, is not because you prayed a prayer, got baptized, go to church. How you should know that you're saved is you should be able to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. That's how you know. So if somebody says, well, Tim, how do you know? I, I'll never tell them because I got baptized. I'll never say because I'm a pastor of a church. I'll never say those things because those have nothing to do with my salvation. Those are like maybe 
you know, byproducts of it, but they're not the reasons. How I know I'm saved is I see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Now, so if you don't see the evidence of the Holy Spirit, the transforming work of Christ in your life, if you don't see that, then one of two things are true. Either number one, you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal savior, and if you die without him, you will spend eternity in hell. That it's not possible for him to give you peace, to give you hope, to renew you, to strengthen you, all those kind of things that the Bible says that God wants to do. God will not do those, cannot do those, because he does those through the Holy Spirit. Not happening, because you don't know him. Or you do know Christ your Savior, but you've so grieved and quenched him because of your choices, because of your attitudes, behaviors, whatever, you've so grieved and quenched him that he's not active. There's nothing in between. We're either allowing the Spirit of God to work in us, or we're grieving and quenching him. And what happens many times is we exchange good behavior, good morals, those kind of things for the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you're just different because you decided to grow up a little bit. You decided to stop doing something that was destructive. That doesn't make you saved. That doesn't mean you made some choices. Salvation is the work of Christ in you. It's through the person of the Holy Spirit living in you and working in you, transforming you from the inside out. That's the process. Religion wants you to change from the outside inward. A whole different ballgame. Religion is what you conform to a certain whatever the, the idea is or do the things. And if you're doing these things, you must be saved. And that's not exactly true. It's about allowing the transforming power of Christ into your mess. And some of our lives are pretty messy right now. Some of our lives have been messy in the past. Some of our lives will be messy in the future. Some of us have a mess and we just keep, we keep it hidden in the closet and we don't want to acknowledge we have a mess. Just like we don't want to be in denial about our mess. Sometimes the mess isn't something really big. It's just something we don't understand. It's something that overwhelms us or confuses us. So we just don't really think about it very much. Sometimes it's a, a fear or an addiction or some kind of thing that stands in the way of us being who God called us to be, you know, whatever that next step you need to take is, that thing that stands in the way of taking your next step, that's a part of your mess. But the power of Christmas is not in a baby in a manger. The power in Christmas is the resurrected king who said that I'm gonna be with the Father and I'm gonna send another one just like me, the comforter, the counselor, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, and he will live in you and he will do the things that I have done in and through you. And he'll teach you everything that I have taught you. The best thing Jesus ever did was go back to heaven so he could spend the Holy Spirit to live inside of you if you know Christ your Savior. So I need you to process this for a second. Today, we fall into one of three categories. Either we see the activity of the Holy Spirit in our life or we don't. If we see the activity of the Holy Spirit in our life, then we should be able to define that. If I said, hey, what's the Holy Spirit doing in you? You ought to be able to have an, an answer for that. Like you see the things that are taking place in you. Or you're gonna say, no, I fall in the category of I don't see the Holy Spirit. I mean, do much. I, I, I pray prayers, I believe in God, whatever, but I don't necessarily see the Holy Spirit. If you don't see the Holy Spirit, then there's two categories for that. Either you're not really saved yet. You've never really given your life to Christ. You believe on Christ, but you've not actually given your life to Christ. Or you've given your life to Christ. You believe in him as your savior. He, you're saved, but yet because of disobedience, whatever the word may be for you, you've grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. You don't, he's not active. That's really the options you got. The baby grew up to be this man And he would say things like this. If you want to follow me. See, it was never about going to church. I mean, church is a byproduct, maybe. Gathering to celebrate is a byproduct. But following Christ wasn't about going to church. It was about following Christ. And he would say, if you want to do that, what you have to do is you have to deny yourself. You have to lay down your agendas. You have to lay down your pride. You have to lay down your insecurity. You have to lay down your fear. You have to lay down your stuff. 
to pick up your cross, your identification with me, and follow me. That's the process. It's like, until we deny ourselves. I mean, this is Jesus talking. I get what you, Jesus would say, if you wanna follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and then you can follow me. We don't think about it. We wanna say, I wanna be a follower without denying ourselves and taking up our cross. That's not a biblical concept. Jesus is the one who said he's Lord. He expects us to obey him and surrender to him as Lord. I don't know if I want to do that. Okay, the problem you have is with the baby who grew up to be the man. Because the man, he will offend you. He's the guy in Matthew who's, you know, the story is that when people were going to be to heaven and they weren't going to make it to heaven. And they're like, but what do you mean we're going to make it to heaven? He's like, you know, we, we, we baptized people and we did all these miracles in your name and, and we went to church and we did all this kind of stuff. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. I mean, he's the guy who says, if you're, if you're sitting to me here on earth in front of people, I'll be ashamed of you when we get to heaven. That's the guy we're talking about. He wants to be a part of your mess. He wants to be a part of your struggle, of your journey, of your fears, of your confusion, of whatever the thing you call it. God wants to be a part of that he sent a savior and then he placed his spirit to either on the outside to draw you to him or on the inside to transform you. The baby grew up to be the man who died on the cross so that we could say that God is no longer holding your sin against you, but he's reconciling you back to himself in Christ. He hung on the cross and died so I could say that to you that God so much loved you that he sent not only his son, but he sent his son in the midst of your sin that while you were a sinner, so he could demonstrate his love to you. That God loves you in the midst of your mess. That he sent you, or he sent Jesus to live with you, to transform you, to give the example for you to live. He sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of you to give you a way to be different, to be new, to be made in the image of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, um, chances are that everyone in this room doesn't have a relationship with you yet. The chances are that everyone in this room who does have a relationship with you isn't living a transformed life at this point. They're still struggling with hope and peace and patience and kindness, fears, maybe addictions, maybe relationship issues. God, we need you to give us peace. For some of us, maybe the day is the day that we need eternal life. That we need to choose the day to make you the Savior, our Savior, our personal Lord and Savior. Maybe the day is the day that we gotta stop playing church and stop just and just give our lives to you. I need everybody to look up at me for a second, real fast, please. So many times when we have these kind of prayers, we pray things like, hey, God, give me this. God, do this in me. God, I just need hope. I just need peace. I need to make sure you understand how this works. What you need is Jesus. What you need is to give yourself to him. All those other things come with him. And when the Bible says, seek first God, his kingdom, his way of doing things, and all the other details we add to you as well, be taken care of, be managed for you as well, that's what it's saying. I, if you want peace, you don't have to ask for peace. Give it to Jesus. You need Jesus. You need the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You, what it really comes down to is, it's not that God doesn't want to, that Jesus doesn't want to, that the Holy Spirit's not prepared to. It's that we have to stop being resistant 
Maybe your prayer needs to be, instead of God, do this in me, it's God, I receive all of you and I give all of who I am to you. Here's my struggle. Here's my whispers. Here's my veers. Here's my insecurities. And trust God to give you what you need. See, peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you. If you don't have peace, it's the lack of the work of the Holy Spirit. Not because God don't want to give it to you. It's because you've grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit and you can't receive it. If you're, if you're struggling with whatever you're struggling with, the Spirit of God wants to work in you. But if you reject that, if you grieve and quench that because of whatever reason, then it's not going to happen. And maybe the day for some of us is the day that you know that in this moment, you don't have eternal life. And if God is drawing you to himself, if he's speaking to you, right now is your moment. Just ask him. Just give your life to him. Talk to him like you would any other conversation with a person and give your life to him. Heavenly Father, we love you. So just now I pray. Amen.